with SAP. Welcome to Sapphire Now. I'm Melissa Chan, and I'm the host of the Sapphire Now Studio for Industries. This episode is the first hour of a day full of customer sessions highlighting your peers and their successes. Partner sessions to help you better understand your landscape and choose the right technology, and highly interactive sessions with regional SAP users as well as industry experts. Hear transformation stories from your peers and learn how your business can become more agile and resilient. Now, we've tailored this show for you, SAP's industry's customers, and we want you to participate, which you can do via the live chat and social media. Here's our social wall host, Claire Richardson, to tell us how. Claire? Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you to all of you from wherever in the world you are tuning in to join us. We are so excited that you can be a part of this year's Sapphire Now. Now, we want to hear your questions, your comments, your insights as we go through these sessions. And I am thrilled to be able to introduce our fabulous social media wall. Now, we're going to be showcasing the very best social media content throughout these sessions, and we want you to contribute. There's two ways to do it. First, you can enter your questions directly in the live chat wherever you're watching, or you can use the hashtag Sapphire now, and these will be coming up. We'll be checking back in to see what your thoughts are. I'm going to turn it back over to you now, Melissa. Thanks so much, Claire. Here is what we have in store for you over the next hour. Hear from Queen of Raw, a company about the value of transformation and sustainability. Get close to the Mercedes EQ Formula E team to learn about the transformation in car racing. Learn how Discovery is helping redefine financial services and beyond. Learn from our partners, IBM and Capgemini, about innovative offers that can help you to transform your business. And stay tuned for a leadership download with our newest board member, Julia White, as she shares her insights on industries defined and how to get started. But we see that some of you are already reaching out on social media. What's going on, Claire? That's right, Melissa. We are already seeing activity on our social media, and I'm just going to show you how this works. For example, we have this tweet from Kirk, who says, I have my SAP swag. I'm ready for this week's launch of the Sapphire Now at Regional Industry Tracks. Join experts as they share their transformational stories of digital transformation, CX, ERP, SCM, analytics, AI, IoT, Industry 40, and Intelligent Enterprise. And my goodness, those fluffy slippers look fantastic from where I'm standing here. That is the beauty of attending this conference from wherever you are in the world, is we won't tell anyone if that's what you're wearing while you participate. So please let me know what you think. Keep those comments and questions coming. And like I said, we will be returning to it throughout the show. Melissa. Thanks so much, Claire. Those fluffy slippers definitely looked comfortable. <laughs> they do. I am now going to be joined by Stephanie Benedetto, CEO and co-founder of Queen of Raw, and Martin Wazowski, chief designer and futurist at SAP, to talk about how industries are transforming and the value of sustainability. But before we start a discussion on how industries are transforming, let's see a short video about Queen of Raw CEO, Stephanie Benedetto, and why she co-founded the online marketplace for unused fabric. I have a five-year-old named Jacob, and I have an almost nine-month-old Jeremy, and I want them to have a planet to live on, clothes that aren't toxic to wear, clean water to drink. And I know that by the actions that we take and what we're doing, we can and will change the world.
Stephanie now joins us from New York. Hello, Stephanie. It's great to have you with us. Thank you and, so much. I'm thrilled to be here. And Martin, how are you? Good to see you. I'm, I'm super happy to be here from warm and slightly opening Berlin. It's happening. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start with Stephanie first. Tell us a little bit about your company and how it's transforming the industry. Absolutely. Well, I'm on a mission to solve the world's water crisis. And my focus is actually fashion and textiles, which by some accounts is the second biggest polluter of clean water globally. In fact, one t-shirt takes an average 700 gallons of water to produce. And if you can believe it, over 2 billion shirts are sold around the world every single year. But if you think about it, that also means that fashion and textiles and supply chains across industries and around the world, they have the power to solve the world's water crisis if we rethink how we do things and take, for example, waste as a valuable resource. In fact, every single year, $120 billion worth of unused textiles just sits in warehouses collecting dust or being burned or sent to landfill. And at that volume, right, waste is not just environmentally irresponsible, this is a CFO issue. And that's the problem that my company, Queen of Raw, addresses. We built a global marketplace with AI-powered supply chain software so that businesses could buy and sell their unused textiles, keep it out of landfill, and turn what would be pollution into profit. And thanks to technology, right, our solution is scalable with end-to-end -end automation, SAP integrations, and we do work with the biggest companies in the world. And why do I do what I do? Well, by reducing textile waste, we've actually already saved over a billion gallons of water and we're just getting started. That's enough clean water for 1.4 million people around the world to drink for three years, while saving our enterprise customers valuable time and money. Mm -hmm. That to me is powerful and it's what drives me every day. Stephanie, that's so interesting because I don't think people connect clothes with water wastage. So, Martin, I think Stephanie's company is so innovative. Do you see this happening in other industries? Yeah, for sure I do. Um, I think what, what Stephanie and Queen of Roy is doing is they, they answer a question that is sort of tr triggering me and many people I've talked to for, for, uh, for, for years. Why are we relevant 10 years from now? OK, and Stephanie can easily look forward with a purpose. And, and this is why the company has a long and sort of relationship building future. This is how I see it. So this is a good example. And if anybody in, your, in the audience, despite your industry or, or, or sector, cannot see yourself being relevant to your stakeholders, uh, if you don't know who they might be in the future, if you don't know uh, if you have a purpose relevant to your company, you're taking a huge risk of actually uh, not being relevant 10 years from now, which is obviously not good for you or anybody else. So, so do follow the relationship Stephanie is building as an example of sort of a vision with an intelligent strategy which you apply uh, with intelligent technologies to drive a business. So with that, ecological sustainability for the planet is a commercial innovation sustainability for your business. And so, so again, I'm, I'm generalizing this, but take mm. anything, take food. Take food, for example, and how much we waste. We could feed the planet if we just uh, apply this vertical farming in our homes, the trend of intelligent technologies coming into that industry, logistics there, anything can happen that is very, very positive. And Martin, what I think um, I'm hearing from what Stephanie's company is doing that's interesting is that she's looking at waste at the, at the front end of the production of the clothing and then on the back end, what happens after consumers purchase it. Do you see companies starting to think this way in terms of sustainability, um, both in the production and then the post, Martin? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy working for SAP because we can touch all these systems. <laughs> it's, it's an enormous privilege to innovate end to end. From, from the fertilizer amount in the ground to, to, I don't know, what do you do with the goods or the services once they are worn out? Or how can you recycle that? How can you be circle? Uh, that's, that's the future. This is where the openings start. Now, Stephanie, tell us a little bit more about your philosophy on sustainability and how you got into thinking about uh, creating a company, a company like this, rather, and how difficult it was. You know, my family's actually been in fashion and textiles for over 100 years. 
1896, my great grandfather came over on a ship from Austria. He landed at Ellis Island and he settled into the Lower East Side of New York. And he was an immigrant chasing the American dream and he had to make a living for his family. So what did he do? He found materials and supplies nearby, old fabrics that immigrants had brought over on the ships with them, but they weren't using anymore. And he would repurpose them by hand with minimal waste and minimal toxins. And he sold to his finished goods, beautiful fashion garments to local customers. And it was an incredibly profitable, successful business. Now, of course, today's supply chains are much more complicated, but our vision is how can we use technology to get back to the way my great grandfather did business? which made sense for people, for planet, but also for businesses profit. And I think there's been this myth for so long that sustainability has to cost you more money to participate. Well, the good news is for the biggest companies in the world that by focusing, for example, on your waste and unused inventory as a resource, you can actually make money selling it today and then put that money back into doing good things in your supply chain. You can pay your workers more. You can use more innovative, sustainable technologies, and you can use more innovative, sustainable materials and without your overall CapEx expenditure increasing. And I think that's how we're not only going to survive today, but thrive tomorrow. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Now, Martin, where do you see all this going? I mean, you are the futurist. Where do you see this going in fashion, retail? But you mentioned a few other industries. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Uh, this is very interesting. I mean, now we're in my garage. Uh, what, what, I, what we do together with Queen of Roy is a part of an SAP's long-term innovation vision. That is basically humans and machines in symbiosis, and specifically in empathic understanding some human genius and this machine intelligence. And, and I have these four A's, as I call them, um, mm. as pillars. First is autonomy. And look, look what, what Stephanie is doing with the machine learning use in the supply chain. And now add that to any value chain. Um, look at the next A, autonomous networks, uh, which is a connection to a larger ecosystem of players and Queen of Raw and their customer and what they're building with the marketplace is sort of an ecosystem of an ecosystem. See, you don't have to touch it. It's autonomous and distributed. And the last A to, to mention here is augmentation. And how I see what's happening here and leads into vector into the future is strategic decision making. It's a little bit like a strategic strategy as, as, a, as a service. Mm. And Queen of our customers can take the, the data they have and the databases and turn it to market value. I mean, extremely valuable profit even, uh, and brand value, but the most, the relationship value you're building with your customers and consumers. So imagine Queen of Raw, but for all value chains in all industries on the business and technology platform that we offer, it's, it's an end-to-end right. -end sustainability VVI platform innovation with a purpose. So that's, that's one thing. And if I may give you sort of an example that is related, I was touching Just on real the quick, yeah. industry before. Yeah, like if you're making two hectares of coffee in Ethiopia, how can you touch the big giants in the industry? You can't. Mm. But if you continue on the, on the vector we, we're producing here, you will be able to control the touch all the SDGs uh, from, the, from the UN. Uh, right. Educate right. the women in your community still making a profit and still be a valuable contributor in the, in the market. Thank you so much, Martin. Now, uh, Stephanie, I, I want to ask what advice would you give to people who feel intimidated and they're hesitating about moving forward and, and combining their business with technology and thinking about sustainability? Don't be afraid, the time is now and build solutions that make sense for people, planet and profit. I want to encourage everyone to be able to participate from fast fashion to luxury haute couture and as Martin said, across industries and around the world. Because changing just a small percent of the way you do business can mm. have a massive impact on our world while building for the supply chain of the future, which is truly one that is more on demand, more local and more sustainable. And bringing about this meaningful change it requires the participation of everyone, not just CSR. This is about the CEOs setting the corporate agenda, the CMOs in the marketing and storytelling you do to your end consumers, the CIOs mm. and COOs who touch this information, supply chain procurement, it's everyone. And I'm doing this, as you saw in the video for my children, I do believe that together we can and will change the world. I want to bring in Claire and ask if there are any reactions from social media, Claire? 
Thanks so much, Melissa. And hi, Stephanie. Hi, Martin. So great to have you here. We do have questions coming for you in the live chat. Uh, Stephanie, this first one is for you. Our viewers want to know, how are consumers driving change in the fashion industry? And how are retailers and manufacturers responding? At the end of the day, it is about your end consumers, right? And what they want, what they need, they're acting with their dollars. And we know the millennials and the Gen Zs are looking for more sustainable options, whether it is innovative, sustainable fibers, you know, materials made in a fair trade factory, whether it's reuse, recycling, recirculation, all of this matters. And they are asking for it. And so brands and retailers want to connect with them. They want to do better. They want to tell that story. And of course, improve not just their bottom lines, but their top lines. And with these kinds of business models and reselling technologies, you can satisfy that need and communicate that story to your end consumers. How much water, toxins, carbon emissions, and dollars they've saved by the purchases they've made out of your sustainable materials. Thanks so much for that, Stephanie. Uh, it will be interesting to see how this seismic shift really plays out in the years ahead. And we do have another question coming in from the live chat, and this one is for you, Martin, the futurist. We want to know what transformations will be possible with new tech in five years from now. Well, um, I think it will include more people, more players in ecosystems that have been closed off before. Uh, this autonomy and auto automation will give people tools to be engaged with value. Like, the, like I said, the con consumers of what you have to offer, they will be sort of uh, owners also of, of the purpose that you produce. So we need to come closer and build relationships. And technology will do that. And the second thing, augmentation. We will have information and knowledge at our fingertips that we never had before to see with transparency, both for ourselves and the consumers we, we are in, in engaged in, um, we will see how we affect the planet, how sustainability is a business purpose as much mm. as it is a planetary purpose. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that answer. Melissa, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Stephanie and Martin, for joining us in this chat. It was fantastic. I learned something new, definitely. The future is looking exciting and sustainable. For more retail industry innovation ideas, sign up for our customer sessions with the Selling Group and Carhartt if you haven't already. So let's continue our live discussion of industry transformation and sustainability with German racing team Mercedes EQ Formula E. The team competes in Formula E, a single seat motorsport championship that uses only electric cars. Joining me live from the UK are Ian James, team principal of the Mercedes EQ Formula E team, and Gary Gary Paffett, the team's reserve and development driver, as well as a sporting and technical advisor. Hi, guys. How are you? Ian and Gary. Hi, Melissa. Very well indeed. Thank you very much indeed for having us on today. <laughs> Thanks yes, so much. Good morning. For, How are you? Yes. Thanks so much for joining our studio. Um, I wonder why did Mercedes decide to enter the ABB FIA Formula E World Championships? I'll start with Ian, but I also want Gary to pipe in on that. Yeah, at Mercedes, I mean, we've, we've had a, an incredibly rich uh, heritage in, in motorsport. We've been involved in motorsport in, in one way or another for some 126 years. Um, and that's through the very successful Formula One and, and DTM programs and sports cars and, and so on and so forth. But what we're seeing now, we're seeing a seismic shift in the automotive industry as a whole towards uh, electrification, electric mobility. Um, and it only makes sense, therefore, that we continue that journey in motorsport using the racetrack as a testbed for us as well in, in that form uh, as well. And Formula E uh, provides us with an ideal opportunity for that. So first and foremost, it's a testbed for us. It's a way that we can go racing in a fully electric uh, way. Um, and then also because we're racing in the city centres, some, some pretty iconic city centres around the world, it's giving us access to a new target market as well. So for a brand perspective, uh, it's a, an incredibly attractive proposition. Gary, how do you feel? And I see in front of both of you guys is the, uh, the, the electric car, correct? Yeah, that's the model of the car, exactly. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Um, Gary, why do you feel like you, know, you got involved in this and how do you see Mercedes uh, playing a role in, in this e-car uh, development? 
Yeah, I mean, for me, from a driver point of view, um, Mercedes has been involved in every top motorsport formula uh, since I can remember. I've been involved in in Formula One and, and DTM, German touring cars for Mercedes with, for many years. And uh, for me, Formula E was really a, just the, the biggest growing championship in motorsport. And for me, it would just be wrong not to have uh, Mercedes in, involved in it. And, um, you know, they certainly bring something extra. Mercedes do things... Uh, differently to, to to most other manufacturers, you know, um, their their passion to win and succeed is rivaled by no one else. So, for me, from a, a driver point of view, it's it's fantastic that Mercedes can can be involved. As I say, it would have been strange if Mercedes weren't involved in such a growing uh, huge championship in motorsport. Can I ask a little bit more about the driver point of view? Um, how is Formula E different from the other series, and and how does driving something a car like that feel? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I've driven in, in, in many different formulas, all the junior formulas. Also, we, we worked in Formula One for many years and, and DTM, the touring cars. But Formula E is just very different. I mean, in, in other formulas, we have uh, street races uh, a couple of years maybe. And it's always the biggest spectacle of the year is the street race, the one that's the most challenging, the most difficult for the drivers. In Formula E, every weekend is a street race. Every weekend is the most spectac spectacular, the most challenging race. I mean, street circuits are... are as they say, street circuits. They're not purpose-built circuits that are nice and smooth. You know, there's bumps, there's armco barriers, there's walls. It's the most challenging championship out there for drivers with these cars. So just driving the cars and, and, and competing on these circuits is a massive challenge, bigger than any other series out there. Um, but the biggest thing in this series is the racing. Uh, with, with obviously the electric power we have, um, you have to be efficient. You know, you, you have to drive efficiently. And that's the one thing you have to learn with Formula E is how to be more efficient with your driving style. And this goes on to help other people in other formulas. You learn so much about how to be more efficient with your driving while also being the fastest car on the track. So that's the biggest key with, with Formula E. And, and, and the detail that you go into as a driver and the mm. strategists and engineers is, is rivaled by no other series. The detail is just incredible. This all sounds so rad. Um, Ian, I understand that this is just the team's second season. So you're a young team and essentially uh, acting like a startup. What have you learned? Yeah, we've, we've been on an incredibly steep learning curve, as you just mentioned. We've, we've only been uh, involved for a couple of years now. Uh, Gary spoke about the, uh, the ch challenges of learning a new series compared with what we've known from, from other series. Um, and I can only add to that. It's been an incredibly steep learning curve for all of us, certainly on the track. And we, we're really starting to, to build that momentum now and hopefully can be challenging for those championships. But also away from the track, uh, it's been a startup journey for us. So we, we started the business some uh, two and a half, three years ago now uh, that supports the whole team. Um, and that's been an incredibly exciting journey as well. We were very fortunate to have SAP on board right from the start. Uh, and they've helped us to sort of build our processes and systems up in an incredibly short space of time. And what that's enabled us to do is, is to get up and running and actually uh, more importantly, through this 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 terrible pandemic that we found ourselves in, um, still continue to grow and continue to, to compete despite the challenges that that's brought. So it's been an, a very exciting time uh, and we're looking forward to the, uh, to the next seasons ahead of us. Well, Ian, talking about startups, I want to go to Gary and ask, startup culture tends to be very intense. You work long hours, you travel all the time, um, and the same goes for, for formerly e-drivers. Um, my understanding is that the racing on tracks uh, can happen up to speeds of 280 kilometers per hour and stuff like that. H how do drivers maintain their fitness? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in any motor, top level motorsport, maintaining your, your fitness is, is, is so important because the races are uh, in Formbury, they're 45 minutes long, but it's, it's 45 minutes flat out intense racing. Um, so you need to be able to maintain the, the, the concentration. The concentration level is the main thing with uh, driving these cars, you're, you're racing you know, millimeters from from Armco barrier to, to concrete wall um, for 45 minutes with you know 19 other cars on the grid. So the concentration level you have to have, and that comes from having a great level of fitness and not getting tired for that for that amount of time. And you know the way we do it as a team, we have our, our team Sunso watches that we use with the the SAP Sports One platform, and we can monitor you know everything from the training of the drivers. So we monitor their their, their training. Uh, you know, performance. Uh, we can monitor sleep patterns. We can monitor recovery. You know, a lot of the races racing we do um, is, is long haul. So you're, you're looking at different time zones. 
Um, so you're looking at trying to make sure the drivers are prepared as well as they can. But the race day um, is is actually not just a race, it's, it's an event day. You know, you'll be starting getting up at five o'clock in the morning to get to track. You have two, two long practice sessions in the morning, then you're into qualifying. And then, you know, probably sort of eight hours after you've got up, you've got mm. a race to do that. Um, so it's, it's really intense um, and it's all packed into to one very busy day. So making sure that the drivers, not only the drivers, all the team have these watches as well to make sure that every one of the personnel that we have is is on top form because, you know, the amount of people we bring to track is is not huge actually in Formula E. So everyone has to be at their, their, their top level really. And having one person that's not 100% can be can be very detrimental to the team. Right. Um, on the other side of that, sorry, on the other side of that, we use the, the SAP Team One app as well, which uh, helps us with, you know, navigating the, the, the challenges currently with having some of our team in Germany, some of our team in the UK and all the travel restrictions that we have at the moment, everything, just trying to make sure uh, that the organization of the whole team is spot on. Um, that's pretty important to us as well. That sounds both stressful and fun. <laughs> um, Ian, I want to talk a little bit about sustainability. We started the conversation mentioning it. Um, how is the team addressing its approach to sustainability and how do you see that impacting the rest of the Mercedes company? As you say, sustainability is, is really at the heart of everything that we do. The, the series itself was set up with, um, you know, the, the shift to, to electric mobility in mind. And that's very much part of, of, of the environmental sustainability um, progress that we're seeing at the moment. But for me, sustainability goes beyond that. Sustainability is environmental sustainability, but it's also diversity inclusion and, and so many other things beyond that. Um, and we as a team, I think we've we've made it very clear that it's not enough just to uh, see it as a box ticking exercise. We, we, mm. we worked hard to achieve the FIA's three star accreditation after our first year, but we want to go beyond that. And, and that, therefore, we started to put together a program this year, for example, we've identified 12 uh, what we see as achievable goals, but right. no doubt stretch goals for us, um, where we can actually make a tangible difference to things. That's looking at our carbon footprint. That's looking at our supply chain uh, within motorsport, which traditionally hasn't had sustainability at the heart of it. And we're seeing that shift now. Um, so everything that we can do to support that is incredibly important for us. Um, awesome. And we've, we've tied that in with some of the UN uh, sustainability goals as well. So it's, uh, it's something that, that's at the heart, as I say, of everything that we do. And we're going to continue to be pushing hard in that direction. It's important to have it be metrics based and not just be, you know, a word that you throw around, which, you know, I think a lot of people do do that. Um, I want to go to Claire and check in on reactions and comments to our conversation. Thanks so much, Melissa. And thank all of you for these great questions that are coming into our live chat. I love to see it. Please keep them coming throughout the session. Now, we have a question for Ian, so I'm going to pose this one to you, Ian, and that is, what innovations do you think that you are going to find from Formula E that we'll be able to apply to the cars that we, just regular people, are driving in the future? That's a great question. I mean, at the end of the day, the racetrack is such a, a valuable testbed for us um, because uh, the, the, the challenges that we have on the racetrack, the, the efficiency that Gary was talking about earlier, that's exactly the same in passenger cars as well. So the more efficient that we can use the energy that's available to us, uh, the more sustainable we can be at the end of the day in, in the way that we apply that. Um, and we're already starting to see uh, knowledge transfer happening between the team uh, that we've got here in, in the UK and the passenger car development team in, in Germany. And that goes in both directions as well. Um, and what I anticipate is that within the next phase, so within the next year or so, we're actually going to see some technology transfer as well. Things, I won't go into too much detail here, but things like rotor cooling in the motor, which are, which are fundamental elements of, of, of how we actually um, grow that efficiency. Those are things where we've made some huge steps forward here uh, in, the, in this particular car. Um, and we expect to see those hopefully uh, moving forward to the road cars in the not too distant future. Thanks so much for that, Ian. That sounds like something we can all look forward to. Now, we do have another question coming into the chat. This one is for Gary, and our viewers want to know what has been the biggest challenge for you and your drivers, depending more on analytics and in adopting all this new tech? Yeah, I mean, as I say, Formula E is uh, it's a massively challenging formula, but Compared to other series, it's it's all about the, the 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 computers more than the engineering. You know, the car engineering compared to other formulas is quite basic actually, but it's all in 
the software basically and, and SAP have been a massive help with, with making sure that our software is uh, is all working correctly and we've got everything we need um, you know we, there's up to sort of 10 software engineers per team looking at every parameter we can on the cars so that's the biggest thing for the driver is actually you have to you have to be an engineer as well trying to understand how the car works. Obviously, during the braking, we're using the, the, the region, so we're actually charging the brake, the, the battery while we brake the cars as well. And that's the massive part of the efficiency, is making sure you can recover as much energy as you can while you're using it as well. So, um, yeah, like I say, it's, it's a massively complicated uh, car and, and series, and that's the biggest difference for a driver, is just trying to understand all of these systems that we can to make the most of the car we have. Fabulous. Well, thank you both so much for fielding these questions from our audience. Please do keep them coming in. Like I said, we'll be here to put them to our experts. I'm going to turn it back over to you now, Melissa. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, Ian and Gary, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. This was super interesting. Again, something I don't know too much about, and I've learned a little bit uh, over the last few minutes. Our absolute pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Great. Thank you very much. For more innovative automotive industry sessions, tune in later for another great automotive customer story with Lucid Motors. Now, don't leave us quite yet. We have more exciting speakers and topics lined up for you. Next, you'll hear from our partner, Capgemini, about innovations for industries. And make sure to stay for our fireside chat with Maya Surmava and Hilton Kullner from Discovery and SAP's Peter Mayer. But first, let's hear from SAP partner Capgemini on helping your business transform into renewable enterprise in a constantly changing market to explore how they can help you meet the challenge of the future. Over to you, Abadesi. Thank you. I'm excited to be joined by two amazing guests from Capgemini. Jose and Mendez, Global SAP Partner Lead, and Elisabetta Spontoni, Group Offer Leader for Digital Core for SAP S4 HANA. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. Let's dive right in. Jose, can you tell us a bit more about the Capgemini and SAP partnership? How do you drive business growth with SAP? Capgemini and SAP jointly focus on bringing value to our clients by helping them deal with our top challenges, industry challenges. For example, in our auto partnership, we aim to help the suppliers and the manufacturers with the many challenges that are happening in that industry, the auto industry. We have similar partnerships with SAP in discrete industries. And I'm happy to say that this year we are adding a new one in the retail grocery. Um, this is industry cloud in action. Our joint initiative have very strong governance. It had board level sponsorship on both sides, are driven by addressing industry challenges and are focused on higher value to our clients. So that's how we do it. That sounds great. Thank you. Elisabetta, over to you. Can you tell us about Capgemini's renewable enterprise vision and what it means for clients in certain industries? We help transform clients into what we call renewable enterprise. These are enterprises that are able to grow and adapt in a market that is constantly changing, like the one we are in now. So the three ingredients are a clean and touchless core based on SAP S4 HANA, extensions based on the SAP Cloud Platform and other hyperscalers platforms, and the right architecture. For instance, let's take uh, what is a renewable enterprise in retail grocery. We can help clients in this uh, industry to not only ensure a multi-channel experience to their customers, but to also help them remain profitable when they are fulfilling orders coming from all these different channels. That sounds incredible. My next question, how can Capgemini help companies adopt new holistic business models for greater profitability, sustainability, and resiliency end to end? Absolutely, let's take another example. The automotive industry, for instance, uh, car manufacturers, are starting to extend their business to subscription models. With our digital core offer and assets like fleet as a service or green caps, 
we can help them not only to excel in sustainable supply chain operation for their traditional manufacturing business, but also to activate and run a car subscription model with its unique billing, asset lifecycle management, and field operation. So we can help company draw their personalized value-driven roadmap to become a renewable enterprise with the right business case approach and all the tools that make their journey deliver early benefits and they risk the transformation. It's been absolutely wonderful chatting to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. That was good insight into how partners work alongside with SAP to build and deliver industry innovations to you. You can hear more about SAP's perspective on innovation for industries in our leadership download with Julia White later in this program. But staying with the topic of industry redefined and industry innovation, now joining me live from South Africa are Hilton Kulner, CEO of Discovery Bank and Maya Surmava, CIO Discovery Health. And live in the studio with me is Peter Mayer, President Industries and Customer Advisory at SAP. Hello, Peter. Good morning, Melissa. Thank you for having us. Yes, good morning. Thank you. Yes, Hilton and Maya, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us in the studio. I'm going to ask um, Hilton, tell us a little bit more about uh, Discovery Bank and Discovery Health and how you guys decided to start rewarding healthy behavior and habits. So Discovery was born out of a, a very simple but quite profound core purpose of making people healthier. And sort of the insight that, that prevention is better than cure. And if you can find a way to make people healthier, the, the sort of the actuarial impact of, of increasing life expectancy um, is, quite, uh, is, quite, is quite remarkable. And if you think about it, it's quite intuitive in the sense that only governments and financial services companies or insurers can really monetize these better behaviors. And, and so what we find happening in our model is our clients are incentivized to be more physically active, to, uh, to drive better, to manage their money well. And in so doing, the sort of the results for them in their personal lives are much better, but the results for us as an organization are significantly better as well. So it's a true win-win. Um, our customers uh, have, a better, have a better outcome and, and so do we. And it's a, it's, a, it's a model that we call shared value. Um, insurance, shared value banking, and it sort of it sort of resonates through all of our products, whether it's in health insurance, life insurance, motor, and uh, and, and bank products. Thank you so much, Maya. Could you tell us a little bit more in terms of details in regards to Discovery Health? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can probably put this, what Hilton described into an example in, in terms of the healthcare. So we, we know that over 60% of premature deaths worldwide is linked to those four primary chronic conditions, which is your heart and the lung disease, diabetes and the cancers. And we also know that primary contributors to this uh, chronic conditions is our healthy or unhealthy behavior, uh, which is drinking, the excessive drinking, smoking, unhealthy diet and the lack of physical activity. So what we do is we actually incentivize and reward our members to change their behavior, to adopt healthy lifestyle. What that means is it means better health uh, for, for our members and, and also the less uh, claims, so the lower claims uh, for, for us as an insurer and the payer for those claims. Uh, they end up in a hospital less often, uh, mm. even if they end up in a hospital and get ill, they actually recover quicker and then have less complications. So overall uh, results in an, like, once again, win-win situation. Our members are healthier, our health claims are reduced and in return, we can also offer them better benefits benefits and, and lower premiums. So another right. important part of this equation in the, on the healthcare provider side, so in the, with a healthcare provider, similarly, we create a shared value model that focuses on delivering better health outcomes. So we incentivize providers to focus on better health outcomes, better treatment, rather than just traditional model of paying when they do something when people get ill. So that creates, and once again, this continuous uh, value generation and the value add in this uh, healthcare ecosystem and results in a win-win situation for all we've moved. Mm. Um, Peter, of course, I want to get your reaction to yeah. discovery and also uh, tell us how important it is for companies to innovate. 
Yeah, as you can imagine, I'm a, I'm a big fan how Discovery really has uh, reimagined in the insurance business uh, their, their business models, right? Mm. So instead of you get sick and we pay, Discovery helps uh, to stay healthy. Mm -mm. Uh, instead of uh, you die and we pay, Discovery helps to live longer and also live better. And I would say also, you know, instead of you crash <laughs> and we pay, uh, Discovery helps to drive much, much more safer. And from that point of view, that's from my point of view, a great model which we see also in much, much more industries which goes beyond the in, uh, insurance business which we, which we are seeing. So a great example. Uh, Hilton and Maya, I want to ask, uh, what drove you guys to reinvent the financial services? So, as I said at the outset, um, we, uh, we're a purpose-driven organization. Mm. And, and fundamentally, um, our, our, have as our platform the Vitality, the Vitality program, which is today the largest uh, behavioral incentivized wellness program uh, globally that we offer to, to a number of our different partners. And, and so, from, from our perspective, it's sort of almost completely intuitive to be offering the right incentives or incentives for the right behavior um, in an environment where we see that, that risks are becoming more and more controllable. Mm. Even today, if you think about the pandemic of COVID, you know, the sort of the, the risk is of, of transmission uh, can be moderated uh, through mask wearing and social distancing. So behavior is, uh, is, is in incredibly important. At the same time, technology allows us to track um, how our clients and engage with them on a real-time basis, how they're utilizing the products. So wearable devices allow us to understand how many steps they're taking a day. How, how, to, how they're driving through things like telematics, exactly as Peter described, and through integration of data through the entire sort of financial system to be able to understand how they're managing the sort of most personal balance sheets. So, so when you bring all of this together with a, a sort of a model that's good for clients, ourselves, and, and broader society, it just makes, it makes absolute sense. Maya, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, we've, and we've seen, I think, just the one thing, we've seen some incredible results from doing this. So we see our, uh, for instance, the chronic condition that I've mentioned, in some cases, the costs are cut in half uh, and then seeing great engagement. Uh, as an, another example, we've launched, when we've launched a benefit, with, we give uh, people Apple Watches, for example, and you pay for your Apple Watch uh, as, as you exercise. So in, in essence, you don't pay if you meet your exercise goals and the watch is yours. Uh, when we We've launched this benefit in South Africa. We became instantly a top distributor of Apple Watches in the country. So the people really engage and we see real difference out there. Great. Now, Peter, uh, I wonder if you're seeing this in other industries, this kind of reinvention and thinking about things very differently. Absolutely. Maybe before you come to that, you see, I, I, I have my Apple Watch already and I did my exercises this morning. There so. you go. There you go. <laughs> so you're in good shape. Absolutely. No, uh, uh, good question. I think from my point of view, uh, Discovery uh, is clearly a front runner. Mm. How you basically connect the people towards the business outcome. And it's a completely different way because you basically start from the customer and you work it backwards and you combine the products and you combine the services which you want to do, right? I, I, I give you an example. Um, we have already great discussions with companies in the industrial machinery uh, business where you basically, you are not charging for the tool or for the machine. You basically charge for that what the machine does. Mm. I, I know you also like my next example, which is maybe more suitable for you, which is coffee. Right. Right? Great example in coffee, right? Rather charging, and, and the business model is all about the coffee machine. It's all about how much coffee have I produced and have I made. And just considering that the business model and the way how you treat the model is completely changing. The uptime of the machine, of the coffee machine is important. The quality of the coffee is important. And the happiness, finally, uh, of, 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 of the coffee. So it changes completely the equation. And, and just doing that, I see a lot of industries which we basically completely will redefine how they will engage moving forward, starting with the customer, connect the people towards the business outcome. And that's the new way how collaboration will look like. Thank you so much. Now, Hilton and Maya, a question um, maybe one of you can answer, which is how did you get to the point where you could push your idea forward? 
I don't know if somebody wants to answer, but j jump right in. I'll jump in. Um, so, so I think the, the, the sort of the integration of technology with great ideas um, is something that's core to, to the organization. Um, from a Discovery Bank perspective, uh, we started off with a, a banking partner when we realized uh, that, uh, that, that there was a, a potentially massive, massive business that, uh, that we could build. Um, we, we really partnered SAP to, to build out the core banking systems. Um, and in fact, a brand new credit card uh, processing system um, that, they, that they, they pioneered with us. Um, and and with, with great effect. So, so today we, we have a, a platform um, which is highly efficient, highly scalable, um, exceptionally, exceptionally robust, um, built for sort of a, a, a future, a future um, financial services organization that, that is really built around the, built around the consumer. I mean, to build on, on Peter's, Peter's example, um, today we offer our customers uh, coffees for exercising every week. So sort of harnessing the, the sort of the, the appeal of the coffee um, with the incentive um, to, to do something that you otherwise might not be exercised daily. Um, and in so doing, uh, create a short-term incentive that we track and we're able to monitor um, mm -hmm. and monetize for the individual to a long-term outcome, which is lower cardiovascular risk over 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and the ability to do that is, is sort of core to, to how we think about innovation. Coffee and eye watches. Those are <laughs> two big things that everyone <laughs> likes. Uh, Claire, any reactions and comments so far? There certainly is, Melissa. Maya and Hilton, thanks so much for joining us from the office, and Peter for being here in the studio with us. And to all of you joining us from home, of course. We are seeing your live questions coming in, and we have one for Maya, and I think this is really goes to the core of what you're doing. The question we have for you, Maya, is how does Discovery use tech and analytics to ensure that customers' health and wellness are actually improving? So I think I'll start by stating that we are obsessed with data and everything that we do is actually driven by data and then insights. Uh, all our platforms and the technology is centered around the powerful insights that we can generate from the 360 view of our customers. So whether, whether we are planning the interventions um, in terms of the health risks or uh, uh, treatment, um, or we are planning a journey, like a servicing journey for our customers, it's all driven and powered by the insights that we can generate. So we collect data from all the possible points. We collect the basic claims data, clinical data, we collect experience data, we have behavioral data, and we combine all of this to really generate this insights and foresight that then drive all the engagements with our customers. Thanks, Maya. I'm sure obsessed with data uh, resonates with many of you watching from home. And we do have another question coming in asking for a little sneak peek, and this one is going to go to Hilton. They want to know what are some future products and services that Discovery and your ecosystem hope to offer. Um, so, so I think a lot of the a lot of the the R and D revolves around um, the learnings that we derive from the, from the model. So, so it's around really sort of optimizing the the rewards that we offer to our clients, the incentives that we offer for a given change in uh, in behavior in a specific space. From a banking perspective, uh, we've been firmly focused on the, the retail space. Um, and, uh, and, and as we look forward, we see opportunities in business banking. We see opportunities in, uh, in sort of uh, international um, uh, forex markets. So, so the ability to sort of take the, the platform, the learnings, the models um, that we've developed here in South Africa um, and really apply them on a global scale, make them available. Through, through partnerships like the one that we have, uh, we have with yourselves um, is something that, that we, we think is quite exciting. All right, you heard it here first, something coming out of South Africa to look forward to. Thank you so much again for all your questions. I'm gonna turn it back over now to you, Melissa. Thank you, Claire and Maya Hilton. Thank you so much for joining us. Peter, thank you yeah. so much for joining us in the studio. That was a great talk. For more innovative customer stories in the banking and insurance industries, check out our customer session with Vast Bank and Haven Life Insurance. Now, in a moment, we'll hear about how SAP can help you transform your industry. So stay tuned for our leadership download with SAP's newest board member, Julia White. But right now, let's hear from Stacy Short from SAP partner IBM about how companies like yours can speed up the journey to becoming an intelligent enterprise.
Thank you. I'm delighted to be joined by Stacy Short, VP of IBM Global Business Services, SAP Alliance. Hey, Stacy. Hi, how are you? I'm great, thanks. My first question for you. Tell us about IBM's work with SAP around the development of industry cloud solutions. Sure, that's that's been a really exciting collaboration. So under our Evolution Partnership, we've been working closely with the SAP Industry Business Unit to really deliver on SAP's vision around the intelligent enterprise. And this is really building intelligent industry workflows for key processes. So we really feel that customers are looking for next generation SAP solutions that deliver intelligent workflows via the hybrid cloud that really are built on a business process management layer and really connect via API orchestration and are infused with intelligence at the right process points, whether that be AI or, or additional data or algorithms. You know, we're building these solutions um, built on our Essentials platform. And that that is based on SAP's business technology platform for capabilities like workflow management and integration. So it's been a really exciting collaboration. That sounds great. Can you share some examples of the solutions and client success to date? We really feel that you know our clients have some major imperatives in these industries. When we look in industrial manufacturers, this shift from products to companies to services companies, um, this notion, when we look at our utilities clients and their, their imperatives around customer service and reducing cost to serve while providing outstanding customer service, you know, in order to answer these, we've been collaborating with, as an example, the SAP Industrial Machinery and Components IBU to really co-innovate on an end-to-end -end intelligent cloud solution that really covers four process areas. One around lead to order, one around plan to manufacture, one around ordered cash and maintain to resolve. We designed these with an advisory committee of four customers, helping us understand exactly where we should infuse intelligence, exactly what pieces needed to be connected. You know, we also have other examples. When I look at what we're doing in utilities around cognitive care, this is really a customer service solution that really enhances digital channel interaction, as well as providing um, an expert system to help uh, customer call center agents. Yeah, that sounds great. And I wonder, how does SAP's RISE offering play a role in helping IBM deliver these solutions? Yeah, so so that's a critical component, right? It's it really allows allowing IBM and SAP to work together to really help define every step of that customer's digital transformation journey. So, you know, in the in the simplest terms, you know, it definitely simplifies the contracting process with SAP. But it's so much more than that, right? It, it really allows customers to leverage the business process intelligent capability of SAP. It starts to create credits for consumption of the business technology platform. It also really, um, you know, really drives the, the cloud component of their transformation, allowing them to pick the deployment model, whether that be in a private cloud edition or in public cloud, and then also picking the cloud provider, of which IBM Cloud is, an, is one of the infrastructure providers. And I think, you know, the other thing is it really allows customers to take advantage of the SAP business network as well. So it just gives us a way to really help map out the customer's digital transformation journey together. What's up next for IBM and SAP around this industry co-innovation? You know, so many things, right? We, we really want to continue to collaborate around these industry and, and LOB solutions to really help our customers accelerate their journey to the intelligent enterprise. So, you know, we're currently working on some great solutions in defense like Cognitive Equipment Advisor and really a whole portfolio of mission readiness extensions. But, you know, one of the big er biggest areas is we're really combining our work around uh, SAP's Climate 21 and our expertise around sustainability. And, you know, this is going in the direction of sustainable supply chains. And it really builds on the great work we're we're doing together with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So our goal is really to continue to deliver three to five solutions, you know, per quarter and really help our clients accelerate their intelligent enterprise journey. Well, exciting times ahead. Thank you so much, Stacy. Thanks for having me.
And I have a feeling the subject of industry co-innovation is going to keep coming up again and again. We've just seen how IBM can help you address industry-specific challenges and opportunities. Now, here's SAP's Chief Marketing and Solutions Officer and the newest member of the Executive Board, Julia White, to tell us how SAP can help transform your business and reinvent your industry today and beyond. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. I loved hearing from some of our amazing customers and partners. Learning from the Queen of Raw that reducing waste is good for people and businesses. Hearing from the Mercedes EQ Formula E team on how its electric race car innovations are likely to influence the cars we'll all drive in the future. And learning from the Discovery Financial Services about its very cool approach to helping people find healthier and safer lifestyle innovation products. I joined SAP about three months ago and while I've always known SAP to have industry expertise, I've been amazed to see firsthand just how much SAP has to offer. Our deep industry expertise and understanding of end-to-end -end processes has blown me away. SAP has expertise across all industries. Our unmatched knowledge that our team has built up over many years, working with many of our customers and partners. SAP solutions can digitally transform the very heart of what each industry does to make sure every process flows smoothly. With continued industry changes happening, SAP uniquely sets up our customers to meet these changing needs. I've seen some incredible examples of innovation across different industries. First, first example is Amerisource Bergen. They've just won SAP's Innovation Award for their work safeguarding the US drug supply. Through our co-innovation with SAP and industry partners, Amerisource Bergen avoids waste in returned medications and reduces the risk of counterfeit or contaminated drugs along their supply chain. Tech Mahindra provides a unified collaborative platform for secure and faster clearance processes. All entities in its business network of port of operations benefit from cost savings. SAP provides more than just deep industry business expertise. We also help companies gain competitive edge with our business network and our end-to-end -end business process integration. We have two amazing customer examples featured later. You're gonna hear how we're co-innovating with the Saling Group and other retailers for solutions on sustainable replenishment to keep shelves stocked while reducing food waste toward zero. And BioCAD, the biotechnology company, re-engineered its end-to-end -end process to reduce the time taken between research and production. Now, one of the things we've certainly learned this past year is that disruption and new business opportunities show up fast and at times unexpectedly. Companies that are ahead on their digital transformation journey are in a better position to steer their organizations through disruption, protect their businesses, and drive future success. Like VastBank, which is featured later on in this track. A digital foundation allowed the company to react quickly to market opportunities and changing regulations. Digital transformation also allowed the wildlife conservation leader, Teranga, to focus more time on expanding education and conservation programs, making an incredible difference in the world. To help balance a running a profitable business today with transforming for tomorrow's opportunities, SAP and its partners have introduced industry cloud solutions. Thanks to many innovative minds across the globe, there's a growing portfolio of industry-specific solutions that are available to find, try, and buy on the SAP store. Graham Construction, for example, jumped at the chance to transform its business through better management of the construction equipment with the ETM Next, an industry cloud solution from our partner, Bearing Point. Graham Construction can deliver construction projects on time and on budget. The water company, Fares, uses SAP Cloud for utilities solution. Clean and safe drinking water is essential for everyone. And Fares now runs its operation more efficiently and more effectively, increasing customer satisfaction and their safety. You'll hear that full story later on. 
we're also co-innovating with customers and partners to develop solutions. For example, one of the world's leading food processing and packaging solution companies, Tetra Pak, to deliver a new solution to enable outcome-based business models. And we're excited about our partnership with Honeywell. Our combined solution brings an end-to-end -end view of your buildings, from financial performance, to employee health, to the sustainability impact, empowering you to optimize your entire real estate portfolio. Another company minimizing environmental impact is Allbirds. The company invests in digital innovation to keep up with its customers' love of sustainable footwear and also provide transparency into its carbon footprint. To help you get a head start on transforming your business, we just introduced Rise with SAP for Industries. These offerings come with services and solutions that allow you to get up and running quickly. Now, many companies are moving from survive to thrive this year. And SAP and our ecosystem of 22,000 partners are here to support you. Running an environmentally and socially conscious business makes financial sense. And moving to the cloud helps you run your company with more agility. Adding industry applications to your core business process sets your company apart from your competitors. And you get up and running quickly, we created the Rise with SAP for Industries. SAP accelerates innovation for your core business process in every industry. Thank you for joining us and continuing to tune in throughout the week to hear more about our vision for where business and business process innovation is going. Before we all break out to explore the many exciting customer and partner sessions, let's check in one more time with Claire. Claire. Thanks so much, Melissa, and thanks again to everyone for your participation. We have some lively tweets coming in that I can show you on the social media wall now. First up, we have Thomas, who says, great to learn. Well, that's why we're here in today's Sapphire Now session from Ian James and Gary Paffett on how the Mercedes EQ Formula E team and SAP Automotive are winning the race to a sustainable future with e-mobility. And I have to say, Thomas, even though we're here in this gorgeous studio in Mannheim, it's so cool to see you in that photo there, Melissa, on the couch. So please keep them coming from wherever you're watching. Now, up next, we have a tweet from Claire. Great name, that's mine as well. And she says, woohoo, Sapphire Now starts today. And I was so excited to receive my SAP slippers. <laughs> These ones seem to be literally radiating rainbows. I'm not sure mine do that. But in any case, she says, welcome to day one of Sapphire Now. Sign in, tell us, where are you from? Thanks for that tweet, Claire. And last up, I think we have time for one more from Sally, who says that she is watching Sapphire Now from Oxford in the UK. And it looks like it's a gorgeous sunny day over there, unlike in rainy Mannheim where we are. She says, where are you joining from? Great idea, please do let us know. So many options, desktop to waterside. Looking forward to covering all things IT. Well, thank you very much, Sally. And thanks again to all of you for tuning in. Like I said, give us your insights, comments, or questions, and we'll come back to them. Thanks so much. I'm gonna turn it back over to you for now, Melissa. Thanks so much, Claire. We've covered a lot of interesting topics today, including the business need for digital transformation and the speed at which companies and industries are transforming. How sustainability is not only good for the planet, but great for business and why industry verticals are key to your success in 2021 and beyond. That's all for the Sapphire Now studio for industries, but it's not nearly the end of Sapphire Now. Tune in for many more customer and partner stories across the industries track. For example, you can now check in with customers across 12 key industries. Lucid Motors, HPE, Philips 66, Aramco Europe, Accenture, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Carhartt, the city of Houston, and Roche. Join our cross-industry topic sessions about sustainability and business network. And I think we can all learn a few things from customers and partners like Coca-Cola, European Partners, Henkel, Vestas, Eon Group, Accenture, and Vistex. Thank you again for joining us, everyone. I'm Melissa Chan, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Sapphire Now.
Thank you.